Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's cool fact of the day is that magnetic coils could break down microplastic pollution. It turns out that our water treatment plants aren't set up to filter out microplastics. These are those little exfoliating beads that you shouldn't be buying or flakes that get broken off larger pieces of plastic like you know, water bottles, shoes, tires, things like that. And those particles take decades to break down, but there's some new nanomaterials that produce plastic degrading chemicals that can break it down way more quickly. In fact, those nanomaterials cleaned water of about half their microplastic in hours. And this is based on research out of Australia. In order for us to practice biohacking, which is you change the environment around you and inside of you to have full control of your own biology, water is a major part of the environment around you, but inside of you, it's around 70% of you. So having some clean water, because you are, after all, a bag of mostly water, uh, you might uh, you might want to get on top of that. This water purification method uses nitrogen-coated carbon nanotubes. And when they mix them with a certain compound containing a sulfate, they generate reactive oxygen species, which just crumble microplastics into their basic chemicals. And if the water's warm, it works better. And then manganese is embedded in each nanotube, and it makes a magnetic, which means you can just fish them out of the water when you're done with them. That is awesome and amazing and interesting to me, and I hope it is to you too, because if you ever find yourself feeling like, you know what, we've got too much pollution, we've got too much garbage, uh, there's no hope, it turns out there's a lot of cool tech, like way more than you could possibly imagine coming online to solve these problems, and a huge number of people really motivated Uh, to help fix uh, those problems. So I'm more helpful than I've ever been about our ability to take control of the environment around us and to help it do what it's supposed to do naturally. Today's guest almost doesn't need an introduction. He's really well known from his acting roles in TV, film, theater. He's a film producer, director, screenwriter for nearly four decades. In fact, he was called one of the best, most adaptable film actors of his generation by legendary New York Times film critic Vincent Canby. He's worked with Oliver Stone, Stanley Kubrick, and a long list of the most famous directors, including guys like Spike Lee. You might have seen him in Full Metal Jacket, most recently in Stranger Things. I'm talking about none other than Matthew Modine who actually turned down the role of Maverick in Top Gun (laughs) Uh, because I didn't think it was the right movie for him to be in. Uh, He's kind of well known for doing that. What you might not know about Matthew Modine though is that he's a tireless activist and environmentalist. And in the interview today, we're gonna talk about consciousness, his own evolution of consciousness. We're gonna talk about what's happening in Hollywood around men and women. We're going to talk about plastic and the ocean, which is a major thing that he's doing, and his own path of consciousness and spirituality and how that is relevant to you. This is a fantastic interview and a chance to talk to one of the the more influential people in Hollywood about what's worked, what hasn't worked. You'll get to go behind the scenes, know what goes on inside his mind when he's acting. And all the weird stuff you never thought would happen in a sex scene in a movie, uh, but he's going to tell you. I I appreciate you coming on the show today, um, Matthew. It's uh, it, it's uh, it's an honor to have you on, and it's an honor that you you come to Upgrade Labs and all that stuff. And so, um, I'm not not here to plug any of that stuff. I wanted to talk about what you're doing with uh, microplastics and plastic, uh, and just general consciousness and sort of your your evolution as a human being uh, is, is is what I'd like to share with with guests. Yeah. Um, and is mm-hmm. there something you want me to highlight in particular that'll help you? Know, one of the charitable things you're working on at, at the end of the show, I'm like, hey, you know, you've probably heard of yeah. Matthew Modine, but you know, where would you go to learn more about? Well, I'm I'm not raising any any money for any any uh, any any charity. There there is an organization that that we set up called Do One do one.org. Okay. Uh, and, and the idea behind that was, uh, you know, my father was a drive-in theater manager and, uh, it, it, I, I'm the youngest of seven and 
so you work your way up the ladder. So the, the worst job that we all had was cleaning the bathrooms, and picking up garbage at, at the drive-in that people threw out the windows of their cars. So I began there. And then uh, as you work up the ladder, you become a, a, a lot boy or you work in the snack bar, you know, a less dirty job. Um, but one night uh, in my dad's drive-in, the ladies' room toilets were overflowing. Somebody had flushed something down the toilet, caused them to back up. And there was, there was horror all over the floor <laughs> and it was about an inch deep and I, I had the bucket and mop and I was staring at it. I, di I didn't know where to begin to begin cleaning this mess up. And my father came up from behind me, put his hand on my shoulder and he said, I know it's horrible. He said, you can get angry about it. You can go try to find the person responsible for it, but it's not going to clean it up. And I, I don't know if I was conscious of it at the time, but I knew that there was a great metaphor that in, in what my father had, had told me is that when there's a mess, we all have a responsibility to do, to do something to clean it up. So as we were children, we kept moving from drive-in to drive-in to drive-in. And yep. I thought my father was this kind of rehabilitator of drive-ins because we'd always fix the drive-ins up and then we'd move. But what I learned was that we were moving because they were tearing the drive-ins down, that the land was worth more than the drive-in. And it wasn't just the drive-ins that disappeared. It was what surrounded the drive-ins because drive-ins were always out away from where people lived, away from subdivisions and, and, and industry. Uh, so it would be quiet and dark. So we were, when I was born in California, we were surrounded by cherry trees and watermelons and cantaloupes and tomato fields. And when we moved to Utah, it was a lot of fruit trees, apricots and uh, apples and uh, pears. And and when you'd walk to school in the morning and in those fall those fall days, all the, the smell of rotting fruit, it was it was so sensuous. And in the springtime, the blossoms that came from those trees. And uh, when I went back to visit a friend uh, and discovered that the drive in that my father had rehabilitated had been torn down and not just the drive in, but all of the orchards that surrounded it, I, I, I began to, and it was it was coincidentally around the time of that song that paved paradise and put up a parking lot. Yeah. Um, that 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 this became a reality in my life that we were losing, we were losing nature and we were losing uh, our connection to the earth, and it, it, that's that's when my journey of consciousness began. That that I, I started wondering what consciousness was. That that those trees that were torn down and the and the earth that was covered up with with blacktop. Did the earth have a consciousness? Did those trees have a consciousness? You know, uh, was it a coincidence that that a tree looks like a trachea and and lungs when you when you turn it upside down? That exchange of gases uh, between a, a, a plant and a human uh, is a is, is that a spiritual and sacred thing? That my exhalation is a tree's inhalation and the plant's inhalation. Uh, or the, its exhalation provides me with the oxygen to breathe, and it sequesters carbon. That you 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 begin to understand that this uh, this chain of life, the intimacy of relationships between all of the species of the planets, uh, has a kind of consciousness, a collective consciousness, and and uh, I, I've spent you know thirty years trying to understand it. And when I was at the the convention that you had in Los Angeles. And listening to all the incredible speakers that you brought to 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 share information with all of us, it was uh, this kind of consciousness. Although it wasn't mentioned by 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 the by the name of consciousness, was a collective consciousness that existed in that in that amazing seminar in Los Angeles. There's something you mentioned there around a, a spiritual thing, and a lot of times when you get into academia, you get into you know, neuroscience or you get into any of the heck real estate development <laughs> sort of thing, it, it seems like there is a question of, is there such a thing as spiritual? Uh, and if so, how do you define it? And so you spent 30 years looking at this. How do you draw the line between what is spiritual versus what is not spiritual? Well, we, 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 none of us know where we we came from, and, and we don't really have any idea where we go when at the end of the day, uh, when 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 our lives come to an end. I, I I received what I believe is a great spiritual counsel from the Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius through his book uh, 
meditations. Uh, Marcus Aurelius was a Stoic, and um, he 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 talked about uh, a leaf on a tree that in in the spring the 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 bud pushes forth and and a leaf is born and in the fall the leaf falls off and falls to the earth uh, decomposes and becomes a, something that nurtures the 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 trees that will come in the following spring um, and that uh, he questions that are our lives any more significant than than that leaf on a tree is our consciousness different as I said before than than th- does that leaf have a consciousness. Um, but spirituality, I, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I, th- I think that spirituality is a kind of connectedness to to all of the of the life that exists on the planet. The primitive uh, cultures that that uh, that were pagans that worshipped the earth and the animals that they that they surrounded themselves that, were, that surrounded them and that, and whose lives they would take. Uh, whenever uh, the life of an animal that they that they killed in order to nurture their bodies. There was always a, a kind of respect and ceremony that was uh, an acknowledgement of, of taking that life in order for you to have life. Um, I believe it was Tolstoy who said, as, as long as there are abattoirs, uh, slaughterhouses, places where people do the killing for you, uh, there'll be wars because we, we lose that, let, let's call it a spiritual connect, connection to those animals that we're eating. It becomes something that we're just consuming rather than acknowledging that you took that egg from a from a from a chicken that whose whose intention was to bring forth a, a, a life and and uh, we we've taken that life and consumed that life and we 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 have to acknowledge and respect the life of the animals that we take in order for us to to have our life even when you watch a, a, a lion who takes down a, a, another animal it, there, there seems to be uh, uh, the, the the acknowledgement of surrender by the animal, the deer, the antelope that's that, that's that's dying, and the 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 anim- the, the, the the mountain lion or the lion or the cougar that, that's taking that life. That, that there seems to be a respect in in that moment of death. Yeah, you can tell the the predator knows what it's doing, um, but it isn't done with with hate or anger or anything like that. It's just that I. I share what you're saying there. It's one of the reasons that I, I live on a on a small organic farm. We have eight pigs and ten sheep right now, and we had a conversation with uh, with my two kids yesterday about which of the sheep we're going to eat. Mm. <laughs> and and yeah. they're not at all traumatized by it. They they know, like they yeah. they feed the sheep every day, uh, and they also are, are saying, well, we should keep that sheep because that sheep has a really good personality. <laughs> and, we, and really good wool, and we should breed that sheep. And these other sheep, those sheep are they're standoffish. They're kind of jerks. So let's eat those ones. <laughs> uh, but there is no, uh, there's no, you know, hate or or badness. And it's actually just, it sounds a little bit dark to say it tastes better if you honored the animal and you actually fed it and you actually took care of it and you know that it had a good life. You know that it even had a good death. And yeah. and I go to those links. Uh, when it, uh, in everything that that I, I everything that I do to the extent that I know how to do it, uh, and I don't think that it's it's respectful of my own biology to say, oh, I'm never eating an animal again because that whole cycle of life. If the sheep don't poop on the ground, I can't grow good vegetables to eat. Right. I haven't bro- I, I don't think you can break that cycle effectively. Um, do you do you worry about that? I, I know you have uh, you've done enormous things environmentally, uh, particularly around plastics and all that stuff. But I mean, have you decided to become a vegan or a vegetarian or something like that because of those principles? Uh, well, I, I live with a vegan. My wife is uh, <laughs> is, a, is about a I don't know more than twenty five years vegan. Um, before that, t- vegetarian. Um, she did it for health health reasons. So she she discovered that there were certain things that when she ate she'd have a reaction in her body. And so yeah. through the, the process of elimination, she found a diet that worked for her. Good for um, her. And I, I don't think that, that the diet necessarily works for everybody, uh, but, but it works for her. And, and because she doesn't want me to cook animals in the house, and eat, let alone an egg in the house, uh, I have to honor her. So when I, when I get hungry, I go to Bulletproof Coffee <laughs> and, 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 and get, some, get something uh, nutritious for my body. And, 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 and it's uh, more importantly, not to just plug the, 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 I guess we can call it a restaurant. 
Yeah, cafe. cafe. Yeah, the Bulletproof cafe. cafe in Santa Monica, right? Yeah, in Santa Monica. Uh, but it's you know that the 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 food that you're eating is organic, and that the the, the animals have have eaten food that they're supposed to be eating. Yeah, uh, and not full of antibiotics, and and uh, uh, you know they're grass fed animals, and they're hopefully living uh, wonderful lives before they they go to slaughter. I, I do my um, best in the in the coffee shop, uh, but it's it's interesting. A lot of the small family farmers, the ranchers. My original vision there was, hey, every month I'm going to feature, uh, you know, beef or lamb from a, a a small local farm, and maybe it's only one or two animals, but it's going to be an extra, you know, three bucks. But you can get you know the the steak yeah. from from somewhere special, it's sort of like you'd have a wine. But then you find out that unless they're slaughtered in USDA certified things, restaurants aren't allowed to serve them, even if you can buy them at home. Uh, so I was blocked by regulations from doing that, which was sad because a, a rancher who's connected to the animals will actually say, you know what? I don't want to go to an industrial slaughterhouse for my precious animals because they don't treat the animals well. So they'll go to a local butcher who gives the animal a good death and butchers uh, the animal uh, in, in a, an appropriate, proper way but then they can't sell it at a restaurant. And that stymied me. Like, uh, how yeah. do you solve this problem? Unfortunately, there are some good commercial grade, you know, they'll mail, they'll mail uh, beef to you and things like that. But even some of that you can buy, but you can't serve in a restaurant. But that said, everything is grass fed, organic, you know, to, to the very yeah. highest standards that I can legally do. But isn't yeah. it surprising that we have a regulatory system that prevents good stuff? Yeah, it's kind of shocking. I mean, does that mean that if I went out and caught a fish that I couldn't bring it in and serve it in the restaurant? Like if I went up to wow. Alaska and caught some salmon and brought them in and said, hey, here you go. You, If you caught it and you ran the restaurant, you could, but the restaurant probably couldn't buy salmon from someone who caught the salmon unless they had a commercial fishing license and unless the salmon was packed in a USDA certified facility. Wow. That's kind yeah. of crazy. That's it, crazy. It is crazy. And I could see, you know, the, the, the FDA has done a great job of, of increasing food safety. Um, it, unfortunately, it also increases food waste beyond belief. Yeah. So you asked me about plastic. Um, yeah. uh, when, I, when I was in college, I was studying astronomy and oceanography. And the, uh, astronomy was going to crush me because of the math. And uh, emotionally, I, I couldn't handle it because the vastness of the universe was too great. That, <laughs> you know, we, we'd, we'd hear as children that there are more... Uh, grains of, of sand on the earth is, than there are, or, or there's more stars in the sky than there are grains of, grains of sand on the beach. And I anybody who's ever sat on a beach, you just think that's impossible. That they, Look at all the grains of sand. It, it, it couldn't be. And the Hubble Space Telescope has uh, shown us that the possibility is real. Yeah. Um, it, it's just so big. Um, I, I sat at my uh, great grandmother's knee who crossed the United States. She was born in, in uh, 1890 and she'd crossed the country in a wagon. And, and uh, it, so I was sitting at her knee in 1969 when we landed on the moon and she talked to me about all the things that she'd seen in her life, you know, with wow. television and radio and the first world war, the second world war, the Vietnam war, the Korean war, um, the commercial air flight, uh, television, you know, it was it was just extraordinary. And she said, and here I sit watching man uh, go where humans had never gone before, walking on the surface of the moon. And uh, that that look back that that of uh, uh, the I think they call it Earthrise, the really famous yeah. photograph. Um, it, it 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 was a one of those things that altered my conscience consciousness again was the the uh, the fragility of our planet. And what you saw when you looked from the moon at the earth was that there was really only one ocean, that we've, we've, we're the ones that divided it up into different things, but the circulatory system of the ocean, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's like our bodies, that, that it's flowing and there, there are uh, uh, five gyres in the, in the, in the ocean where the, where the ocean mixes and, and, and meets uh, each other. And, and, Maybe information is shared and mixed together, uh, but but one of those those things that's mixed together in those gyres is plastic. Yeah, um, plastic. Uh, uh, it, 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 we now live in what we call the anthropomorphic 
anthropomorphic. I don't know how to say that word. It's a, the, 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 yeah. the, period, the period of human beings. So uh, to, to have an epoch named after you or, or a, 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 a something, an event like the meteorite hitting the earth and wiping out the dinosaurs, that for something to cha- receive a name, it has to have an impact of something like a million years, that in a million years' time, uh, there will be plastics and ceramics and concrete. Uh, if, you know, if, if, if we're no longer here, that will be our footprint that we left upon the earth. And uh, the plastics, the, that you know, we use 500 million straws a day in the United States. And, and I, I, I commend you and I congratulate you for, for removing them from, from the, the bulletproof coffee, you, coffee shops. You did that, Matthew, because I, I insisted when we opened everything be biodegradable. So all of the plastic cups and all that stuff, they're all corn based. And by the way, I, I'm opposed to corn agriculture. It's just the best I could do. At least they were biodegradable. Yeah. And then you yeah. came along at Upgrade Labs there uh, when we met and you're like, hey, Dave, you still have plastic straws. I'm like, they're <laughs> biodegradable. And you're like, yeah, but they take 30 years, buddy. You could do better. So yeah. we replaced them with paper. But it was seriously yeah. because you told me to do it and I hadn't thought of it. So thank you. Yeah. Just, yeah. You're, you know, it, it's no excuses. My, my, should have been, should have been yeah. paper the whole time. Uh, so as you start to study this problem of plastics, um, that the, when we see all the bottles on the beach and stuff, that, that is a problem. That is a, a great, gigantic problem. But the, the greater problem, is the decomposing of those plastics. Yeah. So as they as they they stay out in the sea uh, in all kinds of different plastic that's been dumped in the in the ocean for 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 decades now, uh, the sun and the salt water uh, they start to degrade the plastic and it comes apart. But it doesn't it, it doesn't disappear. It just becomes smaller and smaller and becomes what we call microplastics. And in those gyres that you've heard about the great, the great uh, Pacific garbage patch out in the Pacific Ocean, uh, that's up toward uh, uh, Alaska and off the coast of Canada, there's, right, a, right there's, a, there's, there's one of those gyres where the, where the ocean is, is spinning like an eddy in a stream. And it sorts out the plastic. And, 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 and on different parts of the shores, different kinds of plastics appear on the, on the it, it sorts it, you know, it sorts it out. Um, but where did the, besides breaking down, where are these microplastics coming from? Uh, a, a large part of it is, is synthetic clothing. Uh, it's shoes made out of plastic that as we walk, it, we, our shoes wear out. And we don't think, we're not conscious of the fact that the shoes wear out and become microplastics. They become dust, like tires going down the road, that the, the millions and millions and millions of cars around the world, that, that as their tires wear down, it becomes a dust. And uh, if, you, if you go out, especially in Los Angeles, and, and uh, wipe the surface of anything on any busy street, you'll see your hands covered in black dust. That's mostly, that's mostly uh, tires. That's mostly tire dust. And that uh, it, it ends up in the ocean. It, it, when it rains, it goes down in the gutters. It goes down in the streams. Uh, it ends up in, in, in our oceans. And uh, the, the bad thing about plastics, the really bad thing about plastics, is they mimic estrogen. Mm-hmm. And so what we're starting to see from the, it, it, as the food chain goes up, the microorganisms that are eating the plastic that can cons- mistakenly consume it for something that, uh, that, that they think is food, and then it goes up the food chain, that we're starting to see fish that are hermaphrodites, that, that uh, there's more and more uh, female fish and less and less male fish. And the, the, uh, I, I don't have to paint a picture of what that, that future of the ocean could look like because of because of these microplastics. A recent study too just found a, a very strong association between high levels of estrogen in the first trimester and autism. Uh-huh. And so it, it's affecting human brains as well. I, I wanted to go deep with you on, on ocean plastic. I've been thinking about this. Um, last year, I, I helped to fund uh, one of the X prizes that they're creating around carbon capture to pull carbon um, out of the air and do something useful with it. Uh, one of the things might actually be, you know, to to make building blocks or something like that. But I've I've been thinking about this ocean plastic thing, and you look at harm minimization. And I'm I'm a hacker engineering guy. It seems to me that I would rather burn plastic and then capture the toxic fumes because we can scrub smoke really effectively. Sweden figured out how to do that in car, in coal plants a long time ago. 
So what if you just had a barge out there in the middle of the gyre, just picking up the plastic, burning it, <laughs> maybe mm. uh, generating some extra electricity if you really wanted to, but who needs electricity in the middle of the ocean? Literally just dumping the heat into the ocean. Because the micro particles won't form if you just burn it all. And mm. yes, you'll get carbon in the air. If you wanted to, you could use all that electricity to capture the carbon. But regardless, wouldn't just burned plastic be less bad for the environment than unburned plastic floating in the ocean? It's an interesting question. Um, the cold water in the ocean is, is, uh, it creates a layer that sequesters carbon uh, on the bottom of the ocean. Right. It, it, as the oceans heat up, uh, that carbon could be released uh, and make the air unbreathable. If we heated uh, up the ocean that much, but burning all the plastic in the ocean wouldn't change its temperature in a meaningful way. I, I don't. I don't know. It's it's a, it's a, a scary thing playing God. <laughs> it, it is, but I mean, we're doing it anyway. Uh, I, I, it's, yeah. it's sort of like you know, if you're going to eat something, uh, like your your wife, she figured out I don't eat this because it makes me feel bad, right? And yeah. and I, I certainly have foods where I know if I eat that, I, my joints hurt, so I don't eat that. And it's yeah. the idea. I think the, the 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 better solution is trying to figure out ways to to you know, make shoes or tires that, that don't, yeah. out of a different material. How difficult would that be? Oh, well, the uh, long-term solution, no doubt, we've got yeah. to change how we manufacture stuff. The thing is, we got to clean up the mess we already made, because I'm planning yeah. to be here for at least another 150 or so years. Uh, so I don't want to wallow in that stuff. So, yeah. you know, step step one, right away, yeah. start figuring out the tech to, to replace things that aren't sustainable. And step yeah. two, clean up the garbage. And I'm, I, you know, maybe someday I'll be in an economic uh, mm. position to just fund the barge with you know million yeah. dollars worth of smoke cleanup stuff and just go out there and instead of trying to haul it back to to the land to recycle it. And guess what? Newsflash: most places don't recycle plastic. You separate it out and you feel like a good person. You wash it. All you're doing is wasting water because they throw it in the dump anyway. Right. So, right. like, what That's what it. do we do? <laughs> I, yeah, I'm, I'm stymied with where we are now, and it, it's see, bad. I, I just worked in yeah. Mississippi, and they had they had uh, no recycling facilities at all. That that uh, that you know, coming from New York or Los Angeles, where there's an effort, and as you say, that the efforts that we make are often futile because they they you know will separate the garbage in New York City, and the garbage may come and it all goes in the back of the same truck. And it was just <laughs> it was uh, just all a waste of time. Yeah, but in Mississippi, there there was not even an effort to. To uh, to recycle anything, they, I, I don't know what they do with it. If they just take it out and bury it, or if they're burning the garbage, uh, you know, uh, burning burning. Uh, as you say, that's it's wonderful to know. I I never th thought that you could uh, safely burn plastic and scrub it and keep those, uh, di I guess, uh, dioxins right that from yeah. burning plastic uh, from entering into the atmosphere. Um, if there's a way to to uh, prevent that happening, that that could be a good solution. But but. I thought it was so wonderful when, uh, or uh, you know, big clothing manufacturers like uh, not North Face, but uh, you know, they were they were uh, Pan Patagonia. They were making yeah. cl clothing out of recycled plastic bottles. Uh, how t how terrific that they! But but again, those plastic uh, ma clothing materials and yoga pants and things with synthetic fabrics, when when they wash, they degrade and they create another kind of microplastic. Um, so, so finding a solution to the garment, I mean, the, the garment industry is probably the second greatest polluter on the planet. Yeah. Uh, a pair of blue jeans, I, I, I heard it. I mean, it's an extraordinary, uh, a frightening number. I think it's like 16,500 gallons of waters or more go into the, the manufacturing of, from, from growing the cotton to making, making the pair of jeans uh, is, is consumed in a pair of denim pants. Um, that's unacceptable. And those are cotton denim pants, right? Yes. At yeah. least it's biodegradable. I, I have, I'm not perfect from a clothing perspective by a long shot, uh, but if I can get wool, wool's awesome because it doesn't get body odor and it will not make microparticles in the ocean. It's fully yeah. biodegradable. And if you fed the sheep right, it's actually building soil as yes. it's growing wool. And yes. soil is the greatest carbon capture technology we have. Absolutely. Uh, that said, it's not exactly vegan. Um, but then again, I'm not vegan either, so I, I'm okay with that. Yeah. But you got wool, you got cotton, uh, and you've got hemp. And hemp is clearly like the most efficacious way to to make clothes. So hopefully, as we move forward, we'll have 
you know, more, more clothing made out of those things. Uh, but when it comes to the good old fashioned, what are we going to drink out of thing? Uh, do you have any thoughts about, you know, what, what's, what's the best, uh, the best thing other than obviously having filtered water available uh, with good filters, which has never happened uh, in most places. Um, what, what are your thoughts? I mean, what, what do you, what do you do when you want to get a bottle of something? Yeah, that's, I mean, <laughs> the, you know, what would be the solution? The greatest, the greatest solution is to make the water supply safe. And, and, uh, like in Los Angeles, they say when you drink water from the tap, you're getting uh, hormones. You're getting from you know birth oh, yeah. control, birth control. Uh, the, you know the drugs that people uh, that are that are taking drugs, and when they urine, they, they urinate, it gets it into the. They, they're not able to filter these things really successfully out of the uh, the public utility water. Um, so uh, I have uh, in, here in Los Angeles, I have a, a whole house water filtration yeah. system to remove as much of the crap as I can. Um, uh, lucky me that I'm able to afford something like that, but how unfortunate that, that, that the citizens of Los Angeles uh, are drinking water that's compromised, that has too much chlorine in it. And we, we know what the effects of drinking, of consuming and bathing in chlorine is. So wouldn't it, wouldn't it be uh, a, a, the, the biggest best solution would de- be to eliminate bottled water altogether because the water that it comes out of the tap is actually safe and not full of chemicals and drugs. Yeah, I I would love that day. It's it's really irritating to me because you go to a restaurant and they say, oh, our water is filtered. And then mm-hmm. you drink it. Well, if by filtered, you mean you uh, did something so it smells a little bit less like chlorine, but it still <laughs> is chlorinated. So you can check the box that says filtered, but we put pretty extensive filtration stuff in the Bulletproof Coffee Shop because you can't make good coffee without properly filtered water, and it has to, it has to actually be drinkable water. Mm-hmm. So you go to a restaurant and you say, I, I want a glass of water. If they say filtered, even if they bring it in a fancy bottle, it doesn't smell filtered, and it's not filtered, and they didn't get the hormones and drugs. But if you go to a restaurant that has a $5,000 filtering system and the water is totally drinkable, there's no way for you to know. Uh-huh. So you're stuck with it's kind of a Russian roulette thing, right? I don't know what I'm getting, or I'm going to order, you know, a bottle of some, you know, some kind of water because I know that's filtered. Hopefully, a glass bottle is is even ideal there. But we have to fix that so you can say filtered with levels one through five. Yeah. So if you're going to provide water, at least we have some standards. And all of this stuff is so much work to do, and there's no real big profitable industry. Uh, that's going to fund that. And that's that's one of those conscious things. I, I think a lot of the the consciousness that we're dealing with is uh, it's an emergent behavior where it, it it appears that there's this grand intelligence, but what happens is you follow these small rules infinite numbers of times and these complex things happen. It's like, how do we, how do we build our system so that we would naturally have proper filtration in restaurants? So you could just mm-hmm. go to a, anywhere you want and just, oh, I know the water's clean. And that's that's the big challenge. How do we change our environment that way? Have you have you thought about that in your your quest for consciousness over the last thirty years? Yes, it's it's it, it's 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 un it's unconscionable and it's unsustainable to think that uh, that we that it makes sense to bring water from France to the United States or uh, bubbled mountain water from any place to to and ship it thousands of miles. When you think of the carbon footprint, oh, it's stupid. It's, it's insane. But so it, maybe there's a way if, if, you know, there, I don't know how many million people in Los Angeles, if all of them and they spend uh, $20 a month, $30 a month purchasing filtered water that they feel is safe. If, if, if you could say rather than doing purchasing that water, I'm going to contribute my $30. So Three thousand six hundred dollars, or three three hundred sixty. What is it a, a year? If it was thirty dollars a year times twelve, is that three hundred sixty? Mm-hmm. Yeah, three sixty. Yeah. Three hundred sixty dollars a year to the Department of 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 Water to put in a proper water filtration system that that guarantees that I'm going to be drinking water that's as good as artisanal water that's coming from uh, Northern California or or you know from some artesian well uh in 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 some other country 
that that I would I would pay that, and I I would pay for I would pay three hundred sixty dollars for somebody who couldn't afford it. You know, I would contribute on their behalf, and and if if a million people did that, I I think that uh, in a, in a city of I don't know tens of millions of people, uh, y- y- you can see that that would be a very successful system. I, I would love to see uh, more landlords. So many people now in, in LA and other places are uh, you know, moving into shared apartment situations or you just mm. have your own apartment, but the building owners are in a really unique situation to say, you know what? Rent is going to be $30 a month higher here, but your water's free and drinkable. And yeah. I I think that's where we're going. I'm I'm yeah. I'm pretty excited about that. And, and and one Wi-Fi. Why why do we all pay individual Wi-Fi when you know the one if here in in Venice, you know the houses are so close together that you could have one Wi-Fi that would take care of four houses. I mean, I don't think any of us are doing anything on our Wi-Fi's that would uh, create so much uh, uh, activity that that it would slow the internet down. Oh yeah. In fact, you could have a lot less Wi-Fi antennas, which would probably increase human health anyway. There's yeah. really good evidence sleeping on top of a Wi-Fi antenna reduces your sleep quality, and there's probably some other negative effects as well. Yeah. Now, when I drink clean water, uh, when I eat clean stuff, um, my ability to meditate goes up. Uh, I, I I feel like I am a more spiritual person when my hardware is is running relatively well. Well. Do you notice an effect uh, when when you take better care of your you know your meat that your spiritual awareness your uh, ability to be conscious goes up? Well, there's no question. There's, there's no question that uh, I studied acting with a with a wonderful woman named Stella Adler, and and she said to begin every day uh, looking at something that was bigger than you, uh, wow. and, and, and that could be a tree. You know, something that's been in the ground for uh, maybe uh, two lifetimes before you came into the world. Uh, it touched that tree. Look at the tree. Look how the tree has, has had to contort its trunk in order to be able to find the nurturing light from the sun. Uh, and when you look at that contortion, when you see the bends in the tree, that, that, that can help you to understand how to play someone like Richard III, who's, who's been, you know, who's, who's deformed by the, the 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 sheer fact that he was born into a family of royalty uh, right. and the in the in the complications that come with uh, uh, being in a famous family of royal royalty that that uh, y- y- you know if you look at the mountains look up at the sky and and the vastness of it and the and the and the oxygen that it provides you to, to be able to 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 wake up and take a deep breath um, that that realizing you know where our conversation began began that you're part of this great cycle of life you know that you're not bigger or more important than it you're you're a, 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 maybe a, a a keystone character in it you know an important part of the of the chain but you're not you're not bigger or more important than the than the least of us yeah and that helps me to sleep that helps me to keep me humble and and uh, to, to sleep well at night there's this notion of the the gyres, these big eddies uh, in the ocean that are filtering plastic. And when one of the things that blew my mind as I started studying spirituality and all was uh, this idea that you're kind of a hollow tube <laughs> in that yeah. you have matter that comes in, stuff you eat and breathe, uh, and light actually, uh, and then you know stuff that goes out. And stuff that goes out, obviously, you know, there's going to the bathroom, but you know, you're shedding your skin, you know, your cells are turning over. So the body that you have, uh, you know, two years from now uh, is 50% of the cell membranes are new over the last year. And it takes seven years to turn over half your collagen in your body. And, and so really, you and I are, are just an eddy moving through matter, yeah. but the body yeah. itself doesn't, doesn't really exist. And that means, though, what you take in and what you take out and, and the effect that you have on others you know, energetically, with you know how how full of anger or hate or love or compassion are you? That it it probably affects other people's eddying in some way or another. And what what I want to know from you is, I, I am no actor. Um, when you play, you know, someone in Full Metal Jacket, or or you you play someone who's highly elevated, does it? I mean, does it affect you at a soul level? Like, do you take on that energy of a character that? So you know, you're 
if you play someone dark, does it make you dark? If you play someone light, does it make you light? Yes. It does. Yeah. 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 And it, it's, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's difficult. You know, I, I imagine when I got to this stage of my life that I'd be uh, uh, speaking truth to power, that I, w- I would be uh, playing Jimmy Stewart and Henry Fonda and Gary <laughs> Cooper kind of roles. And, uh, but the, there's a transition, there's a, a pivot in our culture now. And, and those uh, roles are, are given to other people uh, uh, as they should, you know, because they were, there was an imbalance in, in uh, who played those kind of roles. They were generally uh, w- white men. And now those roles are be played by people of color and and women, and uh, and to hear their strength, their personal strength, and their personal stories, that it that it it they're part of the fabric of life, and they're 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 an important thread, in, and and uh, you know like uh, like a pair of ladies uh, nylon stockings that it, it only takes a. Uh, uh, bumping into something sharp that, that causes the fabric to come, you know, undone and, and run. Um, now, uh, what am I trying to say is that within our DNA, uh, now that we understand uh, what 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 death is, you know, and and Yuval Harari Harari uh, in his book Homo Deus and and uh, what was the other book Sapiens. Now, now that we understand what death and dying is, you know. Yeah. We have the opportunity to reverse engineer because we we we've looked into the DNA, and we understand life in a, in a way that perhaps we uh, scientifically didn't know. If you go back and you look at uh, drawings from uh, hundreds of years ago, sometimes thousands of years ago, you find uh, that something that people saw through meditation, uh, through spiritual practice, you see the DNA drawn into. Uh, uh, yoga drawings explaining how to do meditation. So, you know, when they draw the chakras, they show a person in, uh, uh, I don't know what that's called, when you sit in meditation with your legs folded and your arms out, like the Buddha, a lotus position. <laughs> and and there, there's those points of the chakra points. And and I saw a drawing from thousands of years ago, and they, they showed that person sitting in the lotus position, the chakra points, and, and drawn in front of him was uh, a, a, a a helix, a double helix. Um, you find the he- double helix in Egyptian art, mm-hmm. uh, in in uh, South American art. So it, those people perhaps intuitively knew uh, through their spiritual practice, or just they they saw it because their lives were simpler. That we were connected by something that looked like a double helix, and 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 there, thousands of years later, you know, we make an electron microscope and we're able to look into life and and discover what exists at the at the basic core level of of uh, of not just human ex- existence but life and and the the thing that's different between a, a tree or another animal is just a couple bars in that in that uh, uh that, w- that we're all related that that all forms of life ha- share that kind of uh strand of dna and that's that's a beautiful thing but so to get back to acting now if I'm going to play a hateful person or a murderer, and that's not who I am, I think that if I go searching back in my DNA, uh, I'm going to find somebody who was a hateful person or somebody that was a murderer, uh, somebody that did things that were inappropriate. It, it has to. There, I mean, the, the millions of years of evolution, there has to have been somebody in my in my strand of DNA uh, that 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 did did those kind of things. That that the characteristics that I have physically. In this body that I live in, my nose, my eyes, my hair, the texture of my skin, uh, those things are inherited through my DNA, through my ancestors. So just as those characteristics are manifested physically, the, the, uh, the characters that I need to play exist in my DNA. Uh, abs- you know, There's no question. So, for instance, I made a movie called Birdie. Mm-hmm. And I, I auditioned for the role of Al Columbata, which... Uh, Nicholas Cage ended up playing, and I was I was working up in Toronto, Canada, on a movie with Mel Gibson and Diane Keaton, and and Alan Parker, the director of Birdie, called me and said, you know, congratulations, you're going to be in the movie, and I said, no, uh, oh great, are you going to change the character's name? And he said, what do you mean? I said, am I going to play Italian American, or are you going to change the character's name? And he said, what are you talking about? He said, you're going to play Birdie, you're not playing Al Colombato. 
<laughs> I said, no, 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 I can't play. Bir- I can't play Birdie. Birdie is, he's a, he's a, such a fragile, beautiful, broken person. I, I, that's not who I am. He goes, well, you better figure it out because that's who you're playing. <laughs> and <laughs> and I, I'm not kidding. I got down on my hands and knees and I begged anybody that had ever been hurt, anybody that had ever been misunderstood, anybody that ever suffered from post-traumatic stress. Uh, to please come and help me to play this role. This role, and I'm not kidding you, man. It was like a rush of souls filled me up, and 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 lifted me and guided me through through that experience of playing that role. Um, wow. Uh, Daniel Day Lewis is a friend. Uh, he's not not a, a close friend, but but he's a, a friend because I'm friends with Liam Neeson, and they're both Irish, and and uh, uh, he's a lovely man. But when when uh, Daniel Day finishes movies. I've never talked to him about it, but I always notice he shaves his head. And I think that that's uh, a, a cleansing thing that he's trying right. to do because he, he goes so deep into the roles that he plays that he doesn't just come home and take a shower and wash the character off. He wants to scrape it off his body. So he takes it, takes it down to the hair follicle and shaves it off. That's fascinating. I, I've noticed that like throughout my life when there's like a big change, I'll, I'll just magically get a haircut that's different, which I almost never do, but it's like... <laughs> <laughs> so maybe there's something to that. I never, I was never aware of that. But you, yeah. you said something really interesting. You talked about souls in there, but earlier you talked about how all of the the bad things that you know you might have done are all in your DNA from your ancestors. So, are you a past life guy, or are you a DNA guy, or are you both? Well, I think our past life is tied up in our DNA. You know, when when we talk about reincarnation, I think that that's that's what it is that. And, and, and you and I are fathers, and we've kind of reincarnated. We've passed our, our genetic code onto a next generation. And the interesting thing about that is, is our genetic code gets mixed up and stirred up like that gyre, like that right. Pacific gyre, those five gyres around the world, with our wives, with, with their, their DNA and their information. And we create a different kind of human being. Um, the important thing for us to learn in, in this life is... Uh, that while we're passing on that genetic information is to do everything that we can not to repeat the mistakes that our parents made. Uh, you know, that the, this, this journey, this incredible journey that we're on uh, is an opportunity for us to improve the next generation uh, through wisdom and, and, and sharing information about the mistakes that we made in our lives and, and preventing passing that information on. And it, it's, it's, it's sometimes it's very difficult. And I, I remember one time I, I was very tense. I was, you know, maybe I wasn't working or I was getting ready to work. And my son uh, spilled my coffee on the, on, the, on the dining room table. And I turned and I snapped and I saw my son look at me. And I know he peed in his pants a little bit uh, because I was looking at myself. I, I saw myself as a little boy and I felt words come out of my mouth that weren't me that weren't they were my father and 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 i had recreated a moment from my own childhood in that moment and it was it was horrible but the good thing was because maybe because i was on this journey of trying to understand what consciousness is that i was conscious in that moment to understand that i had made a mistake and where my father didn't embrace me and say i'm sorry i embraced my son and said i'm sorry that that it, it's just coffee. It, I can clean it up. It's not a big deal. And so uh, that's a, a, an evolution of, of love, an evolution of forgiveness, an evolution of, 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 of positivity that we can pass on to our, our, our children. You know, our, our country is in that process now. We're going through a great, great trial uh, of, of what our conscious, our collective consciousness is as a nation. That, that who are we? What, what are we willing to accept? What kind of behavior are we willing to accept? You know, and uh, I was reading a book the other night about free will and, and what is free will because I'm running for the president of the Screen Actors Guild uh, of my union that I, that I happen to be a member of. And uh, they, they, they talked about a young boy who had grown up in Mississippi uh, pre-Civil War and how that, per, how that boy believed that he was nation building and how slavery was, was a part and, and part and parcel of, of building a strong nation and building wealth and, and building a, a, a culture in Mississippi. And he 
he believed in in the slavery because of because of the place of his birth and then it talked about a young boy who was impoverished growing up in germany in 1939 and how hitler had had gave him hope and gave him a, a sense of, of 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 possibility uh by eliminating the jews that were keeping him him down and preventing him from being more successful in his life that that was the problem and the solution was to exterminate those people now those are extreme examples for what I'm talking about when I when I'm would talk about running a union, uh, but it's important it's important conversation because what I was asking myself in, in reading about free will was the the changes that I want to make to the union, uh, the the changes that I think are necessary. Am I going to be on the right side of history? Am I doing what's good for the membership? Because when I listen to the the opposition, the people that I'm I'm running against. Uh, they have arguments that are quite different than mine. And so you have to ask yourself, well, it, are they right or am I wrong? You know, and, and they're th those extreme examples of that boy growing up in Mississippi or the young boy growing up in Germany, uh, they thought they were on the right side of history. So we have to ask ourselves as individuals today in America, which side of the, of, of, of this, uh, of, of the problems that we're facing culturally and racially and, uh, the animosity and antagonism that exists inside of our country, which side of history do we want to be on? Which side are we going to take a stand and say enough is enough, that, that I'm, I'm not going to allow the environment to become degraded, I'm not going to allow uh, individuals and people to be degraded because of the color of their skin or their, their sex, I'm going to take a stand against uh, sexual harassment and abuse of power or, or, or not. So obviously I'm a you know six four white dude. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you might have noticed, right? So um, I when the Me Too movement first took off, I I started looking at it. I'm like, oh my god! Like there's a whole lot of like serious assholes out there, but yeah. I don't have privy to see that, right? Because well, no one's sexually harassing me like that, and these aren't behaviors that I've witnessed, right? So if you know some someone does something, uh, you know, in a coat room or whatever, it, it's not going to be in, in the world that I see. Right. So, so I'm walking around going, I can't believe anyone would ever do something like that. I, I didn't know people did that sort of stuff. And then you yeah. see like hundreds of stories out there. Um, but then I've also talked with people in Hollywood and they're saying, Oh yeah, we all kind of knew that person had this kind of a behavior pattern and, and, and things like that. How visible is the sexual harassment problem in Hollywood? I mean, is it something that everyone's kind of known because you're all in trailers together and you're all acting for 12 hours a day? And it, 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 or, or is it also kind of invisible? Because I was shocked. It's, it's sadly, sexual harassment in uh, Hollywood is rampant. And it's, it's been that way uh, since I, I, I entered into it and certainly for decades be beforehand. Uh, it was kind of part and parcel. I mean, when I started in the business, they still, They'd say, bring the actors in and, and, and get the tits and ass. They, that's how they spoke about women. They would say, you know, get the, the tits and ass in here. Uh, I, I would be on a, on a film set and the director would, uh, after a take, say, you know, come over and say, that was great, Matthew. Give me, give me a note, you know, what was something to change. And then turn to the girl and say, uh, and you look good. And, and, and it was inappropriate. I, 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 again, I was conscious. Enough. How, how long ago was that? That, like, I've, I've been acting now for 40 years. So, okay. uh, yeah. And is it still like that? Is it at all better? I mean, have, uh, we, have we evolved a little bit? It has. Uh, but I, I'm going to tell you a story now, not because it's about me, but it, because I want it, because I want to give you an example. So it's a comedy and the director insisted that he wanted to see my ass. Uh, because it said in the script that you saw my ass. And I, I told him, I said, look, man, nobody wants to see my old ass in the movie. <laughs> and I, I said, if you really want to see a, 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 a guy's butt, you know, get it, hire a double. Give, give, a, give, a, give somebody a job who doesn't mind showing their ass and, and, and see their butt. And he, he, he really insisted on it because it said in the script. So, so, so then began a negotiation. It wasn't going to be full butt. It was going to be side butt. Oh my and, God. and in the Screen Actors Guild, there's, there's a thing called a nudity clause, a nudity rider, 
and you have to sign the writer before a nude scene can be filmed today. Um, I was having sex with, with, a, with a woman, uh, uh, taking her, I mean, the, the details are not important, but I, I'm, I'm taking her from behind and she's up on all fours and my wife comes into the room and uh, I, I won't spoil it because and, 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 and comedy ensues, the movie. Right? <laughs> yeah, comedy ensues. Uh, she catches me cheating on this woman. Um, now, in the nudity rider, it said that all of the monitors would be turned off, that there would be a, a sense of privacy that existed on the set, that non, not, all non-essential people would be removed from the set and you know, to, to offer you some privacy. And I, I got I, I exhausted from the conversation about side butt or back butt, <laughs> or whole butt, and I just said to hell with it, and I signed it. Now I'm naked on the set with my penis in a sock with a rubber band wrapped around it <laughs> that, that that was that was my privacy was just okay. to co cover your, your genitals and uh you kind of go into a place where you i, I think uh it's it's quite common when you're in, a, in in something that's uncomfortable or painful you disappear yeah like a car yeah like like you disassociate yeah like a car accident you're in pain and you 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 go someplace, you disassociate to, to protect yourself. And I disappeared. I, I, I was someplace that, that uh, so I, I wouldn't be hurt by what was, what was happening. Not that it was physically painful, but it was, I just didn't want to be there. It was, I, it was Yeah, it's embarrassing. And what I was doing was embarrassing. I've got children. I don't, I, I, and it was just hard. It was just, the whole thing was, I just had to escape. Now, what the Screen Actors Guild doesn't understand is what happens, you, you, you have lawyers and, and staff members that are, that are creating a, a, a nudity writer, a protection for you, but they have no understanding what, what actually transpires on a film set. So today, the focus puller isn't sitting beside the camera pulling focus. He's outside and he's got a monitor and he pulls the focus remotely. The, the, uh, the sound man has a monitor so he can uh, adjust the levels on the sound. So he's got a monitor. Now they, they wouldn't have been able to do their jobs without those monitors on. And you have the crew sitting around those people with the monitors watching things. And, and that wasn't supposed to happen. There weren't supposed to be any cell phones and those people could have taken pictures of, oh, wow. of what, was, what was transpiring. But I'm on the set and there's nobody advocating for my, my protections that exist inside of that nudity writer, right? So the nudity writer was a joke because none of the provisions were taken care of. Now, I don't say that because, uh, because it's me. I'm not going to go complain uh, you know, about the director or, or the experience, uh, although it sounds like I am right now. I say it because what's important is for that 18-year-old actress that's on the film set who signs the nudity writer, and none of these provisions are taken, taken care of yeah. on her behalf. Or, or, or a young a young boy who is is uh, s sexually harassed and molested by a film director or a producer that that's on the set, and it happens all the time. Okay, you're saying so. You're a powerful Hollywood guy, and in your yeah. experience, is this? And you're saying if you're just getting started, you're vulnerable, and you're younger, yeah. you don't have the benefit of forty years of wisdom. This is going to be a serious trauma, even though it's part of the job. That's exactly what I'm saying. Is okay. that after forty years in the business, I'm still worried. That if I make a, if I'm difficult on the set and start demanding that the provisions in the nudity writer are are are, are held you know are taken care of, that I might be considered somebody who's difficult to work with and may find it difficult to find myself a job in the future. How sad is that? Right. So I I, I see why that's that's a systemic problem. It it yeah. kind of reminds me of of a situation around the the first book I wrote called you know the Better Baby book. It was around birth. And the problem is you create this, we'll call it like a, a, like a writer, a nudity writer, except it's, here's my birth plan. You're saying, I want this, I don't want this. And then the doctors and nurses rush in and they do whatever the heck they're going to do unless yeah. you have someone standing there going, uh, you promised, right? So you're not allowed to do this because if you're giving birth or frankly, if you're the, da the dad in the room you know, helping, you're not in the mindset to be, to be, you must follow the rules because you're doing the work. And, yes. And you're there acting, you're doing the work, you're putting yourself in the frame of the person, whatever you do to, to emote properly. 
Um, so how could you do that and like stop the scene and say, you know, you turn off your phone or whatever. So, okay. So you, you got to have someone there watching out for you and that's not yeah. called for in the contract. No. And that's what we're advocating now in, in, with my presidency is uh, what we call an intimacy coordinator. And it was one of the Harvey Weinstein's uh, uh, survivors that, that told me, she said, you know, when we're on a, on a film set and there's going to be a fight, there's a stunt coordinator there to make sure that you don't punch the other actor in the face. You want to make it appear that it looked like you punched the person in the face or that you were choking somebody, but you're not actually choking them. You make it appear that you're choking them. So why is it that when I'm on a set and I'm doing a love scene that the guy feels uh, that it's okay for him to put his fingers inside of me or if, if he's mounting me to put his penis inside of me? That, that, there, that just like there's a stunt coordinator that's on the set to provide safety for the members so they don't get hurt, there should be a coordinator there to make sure during sex scenes that people are behaving appropriately and that there's somebody advocating for your safety so you don't get hurt. Wow. I never thought about that uh, because I, I'm clearly not from that industry. Do you think, though... It, it, if you succeed in that and you put your your 10 or 20 year in the future hat on, is that going to change the nature of our media where maybe it's a little bit less misogynist? I, I, I mean, apparently, the, if the last 40 years have been as bad as you've been talking about uh, in terms of bringing your tits and ass on the show and, yeah. and that level of things, it has to be reflected in our culture because a lot of our culture is shaped by Hollywood yeah. at this point. Do you think we'll see a cultural shift if you succeed in that? Yeah, it, it's interesting also to see the way the industry devolved because the, the, the Betty Davis or you know Rosalind Russell, uh, I mean there there were, I, I, there's Meryl Streep, there's there's any number of really powerful uh, women that that would never take uh, the, the, this kind of behavior, never f allow this kind of behavior to be acceptable on a film set. That they were warriors, um, and somehow we had, we devolved. Uh, into the situation that we are in today, and uh, I don't, I don't think it's just uh, producers. I think that there were a great many people that were involved and, and responsible for it. You know, the, the agents or managers that, uh, you know, if if Harvey Weinstein came out in his bathrobe with his penis hanging out, that and they called the, and said like, I, I'm in a hotel room, and he he did that, and they probably said, well, that's just Harvey being Harvey. You know, you want the job, don't you? And wow. uh, that 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 there it, it's 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 much bigger than than just uh, Harvey Weinstein. There had to be people that were involved and that were conscious of the things that were going on and allowed the behavior to become acceptable. And uh, so, what we, what we don't want to do, we want to celebrate everybody's culture that's different, you know, the, and and the and the and the sexuality of, of people to to be. Uh, what what we what what I'm trying to say is what we don't want to do is try to uh, just put women into roles that would have, would have been played by a man because a woman's journey in life is quite different than a man. You don't want to just hang a pair of testicles on a woman and say, okay, now you're you're the bad guy and you're, or you're the tough guy and you're solving the problems. Women are so much bigger, so much more important than. Uh, hanging genitalia, men's genitalia on them, that their journey in life is bigger and that they, their connection to the universe is, is so much different than a man's. That The fact that they have the monthly cycle with the menstrual cycle inside of their body makes them different than us and their journey different to us. Their understanding of time becomes different because of that cycle. Um, uh, that Their ability to carry life inside of their body, their ability to nurture life with their breasts, that all of those things are incredibly beautiful, sacred things, and and they're 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 uh, they're so much more than than men in in that sense. And so, what I I I would hope that that screenwriters and film directors don't do is is bring women down to men's level, but to celebrate all of the power that women have. I I hope we see definitely an acknowledgement. Um, of the difference there, because uh, there is a masculine energy and there's feminine energy in every single shamanic tradition, every single traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, yeah. uh, their their energies. And you know, you know, I would imagine because you're an actor, you can channel your more feminine side when you need to. 
uh, for a role and you can channel a more masculine, I'm going to go kick your ass side of things, right? Uh, and that, that they exist within both of us. And I, I definitely see some movies now where they're doing exactly what you're talking about. Let, let's yes. set of balls on a woman. But <laughs> it does feel like it's, uh, it's probably cheapening what could have been a, a deeper story, right? Because you can yeah. be feminine and tough without having to become masculine. So yeah. maybe changing the, the intimacy dynamic in, in Hollywood would, would change the nature of the way people show up on film in a way that, that could be beneficial to everyone. So I'm, I'm intrigued. That, that's a long-term investment in making society better, but yeah. very cool. You're, you're coming up on uh, you know, 40 years of experience as, as an actor. <laughs> and there's been a, a lot of stuff, especially more on maybe the TV side, on, on news, where women are saying, look, guys can become distinguished as they age. And mm -hmm. then they take the w women newscasters and they basically boot them off the air. And, and they're you know, saying, it doesn't matter how good of a reporter you are. You know, you're, you don't look like you did 20 years ago, so you're out. Yeah. And clearly the same thing happens uh, in, in Hollywood. Uh, do you see that changing? I mean, are, are we going to be honoring more of our wise women as they age? Or do you think that that's sort of built into the system? I hope so. Um, that ageism is, is, is something that, that is uh, prevalent in, in our industry. It's one of the things that I, I will try to change if I become president of the union is I, I would go to Jeff Bezos and say, look, he owns IMDb, the Internet Movie Database, and his his girlfriend is is an actress, and and I would ask him to please remove people's ages from the. Uh, uh, even though you can find out somebody's age if you go searching, um, it, it's not beneficial to the actresses, particularly the actresses. Uh, you know, a, a, a woman can look twenty five years old and be thirty five years old. But if it posts their age on on the web on that website, the, it may it may uh, prejudice a, a casting director or a director from looking at that person, and it it, it should be it should be remo removed. That, that makes so much sense. Uh, one of my friends is a, is a supermodel, and she's eight years older than <laughs> she tells everyone. She's like, I don't yeah. I don't want people to know. <laughs> yeah, I'm like oh, oops. Uh, but like you said, you you know you look, you can't you can't tell. Uh, and, and I think increasingly that's, that's happening. And that's, that's also partly, you know, my, my next book is called superhuman. It's the, uh, what I'm going to do to live to at least 180. And part of that's cosmetic. And clearly, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to live to 180 and, uh, look like you're 180. Anyone who's aging would tell you, I'd rather look and feel like I did when I was 30 than when I, I'm 80, but you know, I'll take my life. I'm pretty happy to be alive. Right. How how do you look at aging? Like, do you do you think you're going to live a long time? What what's your what's your perspective on that? Well, uh, none of us are going to live forever. Yeah, but we are living longer. Um, it's one of the reasons that I go to Upgrade Labs is that it, it's uh, it, it's because if I'm going to live longer, what can I do to keep this organism that I live in yeah. strong and healthy? And how do I keep from having to have hip surgery when 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 the the when the joints start to wear out, what what can I do that's preventative uh, to allow me to live the most optimal, most positive, productive life that that I can for for the period of time that I'm here. But I I, I got Lyme disease uh, I guess almost twenty years ago, oh, and yeah. and uh, what what I learned. From, from that was that, that uh, the acceptance of death, uh, you know, we talk about being present and being in the moment. This is what uh, so many of the meditations are about in our life. The religious practices is being present. It's certainly a, a big part of what it is to be an actor is to be in the moment, to be present, to listen to the person that you're talking to and respond that, that then you don't sound like you're reciting lines. If you're, right. if you're, you know, that, that being present, and but when I accepted the the inevitability of my death is when I began to live more fully. Um, uh, that you know, as I said with Marcus Aurelius, that that uh, that there is a springtime and a and a summer and a fall in our lives, and uh, that that cycle 
uh, is, is, you know, something that exists for everything that's living on this planet. Um, and I, I really started to enjoy life once I accepted the inevitability. Um, do I want to, I don't want to die prematurely. I want to do everything that I can to, to keep this organism strong and, and, and healthy and, and my mind sharp. Uh, that's part of the journey. That's part of, and, and I get great enjoyment from it. I, I get enjoyment from learning uh, the, the things from the, those kids, those wonderful kids that you have working at, at Upgrade Labs that are, that are so knowledgeable about the machinery that they, uh, that they use and get so excited you know, telling you about what the pulse electromagnetic field does to the, the cells inside of the body, that, that what the, uh, the big squeeze, what it, how it <laughs> squeezes your adrenals and gets the poisons out of your body, that the, the, cold, the cold hit, the, the uh, machine that, because uh, as we age, we start to lose testosterone. I don't want to take artificial testosterone. I don't want uh, to, to do that. So if I can get a uh, boost fool my, my own body, my own brain into producing its own testosterone. What, what, a, what a wonderful thing to be able to do. So um, those, those are the benefits that, that, uh, that I, I, it's why I enjoy walking from my house. It's about a two mile walk, and which gives me an opportunity to sort of meditate on that journey until I get to the labs and, and do, those, do those machines to uh, upgrade my life, uh, my body, and, and, uh, and, and I always come out of that place. Uh, I, I feel, I, I don't say that because it's, it's your place. I feel a little bit wiser, a little bit healthier, a little bit sharper. And, uh, uh this journey of, of running for president of the, the union, uh, I'm not a politician. I don't have any ambition to become a politician. I'm, I'm an artist. And I say that without apology. Um, uh, it, it's very upsetting. And uh, there was one morning I was walking over to the labs and I couldn't take a deep breath. I, I you know, I try to do this seven, four, seven breathing, you know, breathing mm -hmm. in for seven, holding for four, four, exhaling for seven, holding for four. And I couldn't take a breath that was more than three seconds deep. I just couldn't expand my abdomen. And when I got to the labs and I, and I put that, mach that pimp machine on my, my stomach, it, uh, it, it, it calmed, it calmed my system and, and, and allowed, and then I went on the, the red charger, the light bed, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and uh, I was rejuvenated. I, I, uh, it, it, in, in, in a way I felt like it saved my life that day because I was so, so troubled by, uh, the animosity that exists within, uh, this process of, of running for, uh, president of the union. Wow. So you're, you're, you're really living the, uh, the recover more uh, mindset that's there. And th thanks for talking about it. I, I, I'm happy that we have Upgrade Labs. And uh, for people listening who, I, I don't talk about it that much on the show, but we spun Upgrade Labs out of Bulletproof. It's right next to the Bulletproof Coffee Shop and it's got all the, the cool tech for biohacking that I talk about because it just so happens that this stuff is real. And by the way, Matthew, uh, in the last couple of days, a new study came out. You know, we have the whole body vibration, the bulletproof vibe at Upgrade Labs. Um, a group out of China just discovered that whole body vibration changes your gut microbiome to make more butyric acid. This is the short chain fatty acid that helps with ketosis. That's really good for you. That's anti-inflammatory. The stuff that I read about in uh, how to change it nutritionally with a bulletproof diet. But it turns out just vibrating for. 10 or 20 minutes changes the amount and type of bacteria. Uh, and wow. no one knew that before, just last, last week. But uh, there's, there's some cool stuff going on around that tech. I don't even think we know why half of it works. But I, I, at this point, I feel comfortable saying most of it works for most people most of the time. So th thank you for being you know, someone who's, who's wants to try it. I think <laughs> there's, there's, some, there's something very, very interesting about vibration. Uh, and and it, it, it begins uh, with uh, prayers. You know, like yeah. we say, or, or certain words like home, which is, uh, has om in it, om, which is one of the words mm -hmm. they say in meditation, om. And if you do that and you feel the vibration in your brain, uh, and I, I think that what, it's, what it is physically doing inside of your brain is shaking off some, uh, I don't know, let's call it dust or carbon off of right. those uh, neurons that, 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 that share information from one side of the brain to the other. We know that inflammation reduces blood flow. 
And if there's infl inflammation in the brain, that even the, the slightest bit, and you, you, you picture those beautiful little neurons and the tiny little veins inside of your brain, just the slightest bit of, of, of uh, inflammation reduces the in information to travel from one place to another. It reduces the ability for blood to be oxygen to be carried into those different recesses of the brain. Um, my wife and I experimented with reducing carbohydrates and, sh and sugar from our body. And after three days of, of being very strict about it, it was as if I'd been going through life with my fingers in my ears. And it, I, I, it was literally a pop that happened in my brain and a, a consciousness shift of, of just being able to like, oh my God, I, I, I can see more uh, and, and think more clearly. Um, it, it was literally that dramatic by, by the reduction of sugar and simple carbo carbohydrates from our diet. And, and uh, there was no more walking into the room and going, what did I come here for? Yeah. Where, where did I put my keys down? That, that sugar fog or that brain fog, whatever you want to call it, is real. It is a real thing. And, and the, 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 I, don't, I don't like to talk about myself, my personal life so much, but I think it's important to share that I was somebody who suffered with depression. And that guy that come, would come around every once in a while and drag me into a hole uh, he, 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 he stopped coming around when I stopped eating so much sugar and simple wow. carbohydrates. And, and if that guy, uh, if, if, if not eating a cupcake or having a piece of pie or it, it prevents that guy from coming around, I'm happy to go the rest of my life, not eating any, uh, birthday cake. Uh, very, uh, very well said. And, and you're making me sort of laugh because uh, yesterday I did eat a birthday cake cause it was my son's <laughs> uh, 10th birthday. Uh, however, it was uh, it was gluten free. It had some sugar, but not too much. Yeah. And because I don't eat it all the time, I don't feel depressed today, and I don't think any of the kids do either. But it's yeah. that idea that if you do it every day, man, you're screwed. And if you find you're sensitive to the point where you do it once, it, depression or bad symptoms come back. Don't do it for a long time. But I I truly believe that if people generally do it right. After a couple of years of fixing your biology, you'll actually have a level of resilience where if you want that celebratory piece of, of, of cake and you know you've avoided things that are really bad for you, your metabolism will work again in a way it hasn't in 20 years. That, that's been my experience. So I certainly don't eat birthday cake more than twice a year. It's funny, I have two kids uh, and I make the cake myself and, uh, <laughs> and pretty darn free of bad stuff. Uh, but uh, I, I love your perspective on that, uh, where you know you're, you're saying I, I'm willing to skip it forever to feel that good, yeah, the level of consciousness. That's uh, it's beautifully said. Now uh, we've talked about uh, so your perspective on aging and you know, however it's going to die. If you had to pick a number, how long do you think you're going to live? Given your health, given what you have at your fingertips to to influence yourself, I've been asking every guest this because I'm writing about you know, living longer than you're supposed to. How long? What's your number? Um, well, with the, some of the health issues that I've faced, I, I would be I would be blessed to to reach ninety. To um, ninety. All right. Yeah. If I could, if if I could, I mean, I think that 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 living to be a hundred would be. Would, so, so long as I'm copus mentis, that I have my resources, uh, mental facilities are, are sharp, uh, and, and that I'm able to, to get around and be productive, uh, I, I would love to live to be 120. Why not? Would you still be acting when you were 90 if you had it in, if you, had it in you? You know, I have to say that this, this is like one of the, the greatest jobs in the world, being an actor, that, that uh, you know, it has no value and it has unbelievable, uh, unmeasurable value to our culture. That if you go back, I, I was in, in uh, Teramosus, uh, a, a, a city in southern Turkey. Uh, and I've been, I've been to amphitheaters in, in Italy and in Greece. But the, this, this uh, amphitheater that was carved into the side of the mountain uh, in Teramosus uh, brought me, it, it, it completely humbled me and uh, brought me to tears. Um, because they're, they're sitting at the, on the top of the amphitheater. I was looking out, and I knew to the Greeks, I was looking at air. The sun was setting, so you had fire, and the sea was there, which was water. So those three elements were really important to the, 
the culture of, of, of the Greeks, you know, and, and mythology. And sitting in this amphitheater that, that m- must have been made at tremendous expense to, to those people that lived in that, in that small, small city of Termosus. And, but they went to that expense to build a place where people could sing songs and tell stories. Um, because it is through the singing of, singing of songs and the telling of stories that we evolve uh, culturally, and that we learn to understand other people's points of view, that we, we see what racism looks like. We see what, what being unfair and mean to other people are. We learn to laugh at our, at our foolishness. Uh, and, and we learn songs that we can share and, and, and sing when we're alone and, and bring joy to our hearts. That, that's, that this, this, this thing that I'm a part of, this culture, I stand on the shoulders of thousands of people who came before me. And, and uh, it, it's, it's such a, a blessing to be a, a part of this tradition of storytelling. It's an amazing job. And I'm, I'm so happy to, uh, to, to have been successful in this profession. That, that sounds like a hell yes. Yeah, hell yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. uh, Matthew, it, it's it's been a great pleasure to interview you. Thanks for being on the show, and thanks for being willing to talk about coming into Upgrade Labs. Um, I'm happy that it's it's working for you, and uh, and, and you had you had no reason uh, to to be public about it other than just you're a nice guy. And so, so thanks, thank thanks for sharing that, and uh, thanks for doing the work you're doing uh, in the Screen Actors Guild because I I think if we if we can have a a more balanced and nuanced view of masculine and feminine in our culture. I think it, uh, it might be good for everybody. Absolutely. That's a hell yes. <laughs> <laughs> Have a beautiful day. Thank you very much. 